Chapter 33 Jeremy walked down Gator Road, glad to be in the shade. Large, full elm trees lined the street on the right side. The shade was thick and cool. The fence for Lyle's scrapyard was on his left. It was a chain-link fence covered with green plastic so no one could see through it. Jeremy was sure it had something to do with beautifying Lancaster, or whatever. Nobody wants to see a bunch of old cars and wrecks, especially if the accidents that brought them here were bloody. Ick. The fence went down to the circular cul-de-sac across from Craig's house. He pocketed his iPhone and made a beeline for it. As he drew nearer, he heard someone crying. Craig? Jeremy asked. He thought, it's coming from around back. He ran around the house. Craig was on the back steps, his head hanging down, his arms wrapped around his knees. He was sobbing so hard he could barely breathe. Craig? Jeremy asked. Are you okay? Craig looked up at him, tears running down his face. He tried to speak, but no words came out. He shook his head. Jeremy sat down to put his arm around him. Craig leaned into him and wept with greater force. When he was able to speak, he told Jeremy the story about this morning. He just let it out without a second thought about what he was saying. Jeremy listened, horrified, about the flying dishes and the terror of waking up to a possible beating. When Craig got to the blood on the floor and deduced the cut his father sustained, Jeremy saw why he was so upset. I'd be crying too in this situation. I never told anybody about my dad before, Craig said, wiping his face with his shirt tail. I never trusted anybody. You can trust me, Craig, Jeremy sadly said. I think everybody knows already, though. People have seen things. I wish people would just mind their own business, Craig cried, tears threatening again. Jeremy squeezed him. Take it easy, Spaz Dugan. Some of us like you, that's all. Nobody wants to see you get hurt. Craig looked stunned. Really? he asked, looking at Jeremy. There was disbelief in his tone. You like me? Of course I like you, doubting Thomas Dugan. I always have. I've tried to be your friend lots of times. I didn't think you were serious, Craig said. He lowered his eyes. I didn't think anyone would want to be friends with Jack Dugan's kid. Well, Jeremy replied, you were wrong. I guess I was, Craig said. Are we friends now? What's wrong with your ears, Helen Keller Dugan? Jeremy asked. Of course we're friends. Craig hugged Jeremy and began to cry again. Jeremy didn't know what to do. No one ever got so emotional over being his friend before. He put his arms around Craig and hugged him back. Wow, Jeremy thought, he's really hurting. Craig regained his composure and let go. Jeremy kept his arm across his shoulders. Craig seemed fragile all of a sudden. He talked about his father, but is there more he wants to say? Jeremy hoped so, but not all at once. Craig's life confused him. It would be better if they walked through it rather than diving right in. Jeremy saw they had something in common, though. They were both lonely. So, Jeremy asked, do we watch the sunset, sweetheart, or do we get moving? I think we have a mess to clean up, don't you? Let's do it, Craig said. The boys made their way into the house. Jeremy looked at the pool of blood on the green and yellow checkered tile. He cringed. I can see why Craig's so freaked. It's a bad cut. I didn't think there could be this much blood. It looks like a dried up red pond under the kitchen chair. Jack must be incredibly angry. Still, Craig has to know. This isn't your fault, Jeremy said. You didn't smash all those dishes. Your father did. He won't see it that way, Craig sighed, handing Jeremy an old straw broom and a dustpan. He picked up the coffee table leg from the hallway while Jeremy swept. He'll say the dishes wouldn't have gotten broken if I put them away. And he'll say I should have cleaned the mess before I went to school this morning. I lose either way. He grabbed the Elmer's glue from under the sink. 
He glued the table leg back on and set the coffee table upright. It would dry fine without a clamp as long as no one touched it. Why didn't you just put the dishes away? Jeremy asked, trying to sweep the glass from around the blood. Wouldn't that have been easier? It would have been, I guess, Craig nodded, spraying the blood stains with Fantastic. I just forgot, that's all. Besides, he would only complain about something else. Believe me, when he is, you know, he can make up some ridiculous crap. When he's what? Jeremy asked, gathering the dish shards into a pile. He thought, duh, drunk you mean? Craig nodded, looking away. Can Jeremy stay friends with the son of the town drunk, he wondered. What are his parents going to think? His heart sank. I'd probably tell him to stay away from me. It's hopeless. Jeremy's from a different world than me. His father drives a Porsche, for God's sake. I'm not jealous or anything. I just feel like a mongrel at a purebred dog show. Jeremy's headed to college. He'll be successful. Where am I going? The mill, probably. It took a few minutes to clean up the blood and the dishes. Craig didn't know what to do about the front window, but they picked up the glass inside and out. They found the cast iron pot missile his father heaved through it, laying in the yard, and put it in the sink. Jeremy tossed the glass in the trash with the broken dishes. The floor was as good as new after a quick mopping. Jeremy looked around. Dugan's decor looked like a late 1950s sitcom. It struck him that the house wouldn't look that different if it were in black and white, right down to the rabbit ears on the television. There were no pictures anywhere, no colorful wallpaper. It was just plain. He said as much. Craig told him the furniture came from his grandmother's basement. His father never bought anything except alcohol. His grandmother bought the food. Bummer, Jeremy said. He thought, it'll take a while to get used to how Craig lives. I must seem like a millionaire to him. I would find the whole thing pretty intimidating if I were him. Is that why Craig's so quiet? Jeremy set the broom in the dustpan against the hallway wall and led Craig to the sofa. A few things need to be straightened out right away. If I'm wrong, I can blame it on conceit. But if I'm right... How come you're so quiet, Craig? Jeremy asked. He took Craig by the sides of his head and turned his face back when he tried to look away. Don't you like me? Of course I like you, Craig replied. Everybody likes you. Is that a shot? Craig shook his head. No, it's not a shot. Then why are you so quiet? Craig shrugged. You're just really popular, you know? Jeremy laughed. Craig looked at him oddly. What's so funny? he asked. Is that what's bothering you? Jeremy asked. Craig nodded, looking away. Jeremy turned his head back again. Everybody wants to hang around with you, Craig said, squirming. With all of those people and all of your friends, why would you want to hang around with me? We're not rich, you know. I'm nobody at school. No, it's not that. It's, oh, screw it. I don't know what it is. Yes, you do, Jeremy insisted. He thought, you're not getting off that easily, Dugan. You're going to spell it out for me. I do, Craig asked, blushing and staring at the floor. Jeremy didn't answer. Craig looked up. Jeremy's expression was stern. His eyes were so open, like he could see into his mind. And he was right, too. Craig knew exactly what it was. How can you hang around with me? Everybody's going to think you're nuts. What happens when they see us together and they rag on you? What happens to me then? I don't know if I fit into their world, you know? What if they don't like me? What if your parents don't want you around me? Hold it right there, Dugan, Jeremy said. You need to realize something. First off, my parents don't pick my friends. They don't judge people by their parents either. They don't? No, Jeremy replied. Neither do I. Nobody else picks my friends either. You know how many people I know? Tons, Craig replied, dejectedly. 
That's right, tons, Jeremy agreed. But do you know how many people are close to me? None. Not any who are only my friends. I don't have any friends of my own. That's bull. No, it isn't, Jeremy cried. Chris has all the friends. All my friendships are pale compared to his. The whole group is like that. Sure, they like me, but I'm not an idiot. I know they like Chris better. They do? Sure they do, Jeremy exclaimed, brushing his thick black hair back. You think I ever talk to them? I mean, really deep personal stuff? It's just token conversation. Even the guys that hang around me in school, they want to use me to try and be popular. All they ever talk about is what everybody else is doing. Nobody wants to just hang out with me, and the girls only want to mess around. Well, I'm not ready for that, okay? I feel like a step stool to Chris or Max. They're the popular ones. I'm just the nice guy. What's wrong with that? Jeremy slumped back on the couch. It makes me convenient a lot of the times, he replied. I don't like it, but I still do it. Jeremy McKee, the peacemaker. Max, Chris, Ricardo, Matt, they're my friends, but to each other they're best friends. I don't have a best friend. Who do I talk to about how I feel? True, I have Chris, and don't get me wrong, I love my brother. But he has answers for everything. I can't stand it. When it comes to the real personal stuff, where do I go? It's hard to talk to somebody who solves all your problems without even trying. Craig nodded. I know the feeling. I can always talk to my uncle, but if I tell him anything that happens with my dad, they end up fighting. I get it later for opening my mouth. Dude, I don't know how you put up with... I love him, Craig interrupted. He's my dad. I love my dad too, Jeremy said, even though he's hardly ever around. He never seems to have time for me, only once in a while. What about your mom? My mom, Jeremy asked. He shrugged. She's great. She always has time. But it's not the same. She's so much like Chris. He's her son and I'm my dad's, although she'll never admit it. They're overflowing with confidence, too. I'm a wuss. You're not a wuss. I'm a wuss, Jeremy insisted. I spend most of my time at home because my friends are all Chris's best friends. I try to make other friends, but they're all phony and full of themselves. That's why I came here. I want to be your friend. I figured you'd know what it's like to be, you know, alone. I do, Craig replied. I always wanted to be your friend, too. I just figured I wasn't good enough. Well, you figured wrong, Jeremy said, holding his hand out. I'm looking for a best friend, Craig. Do you know anybody who might be interested? Well, I know this French and Irish kid, Craig smiled. He took Jeremy's outstretched hand. He has a tough time in school, though. We can fix that, Jeremy smiled back. I'm pretty good at helping people with their homework. I'm French and Irish, too. Best friends, Craig asked. Best friends, Jeremy replied. Now, read your yearbook. You didn't peek, did you? Craig shook his head. He honestly forgot all about it. His backpack was inside the door. He took his yearbook out, opened it, and read what Jeremy wrote. It said, Dear Craig, I may be the only person who writes in here, but who cares? By the time you read this, we're going to be best friends. Who else do you need, anyway? Jeremy A. McKee. Craig set the yearbook on the table and walked back into the living room. He sat on the couch, sighed, and then hugged Jeremy again. Jeremy laughed. Man, Dugan, you sure hug a lot. Just don't kiss me. He hugged him back. You'd be making friends with the wrong McKee brother. Craig let go and asked, Is Chris really gay? Yes. Does it matter? Nope. Craig replied, I never met a gay guy before, that's all. Jeremy muttered, Me neither. Craig got up in motion for Jeremy to follow him. He went to the hall and pulled on the string hanging from the ceiling. He lowered and unfolded the attic stairs. Craig started up the steps. They were rickety. Jeremy held them for him. 
He followed Craig, snickering at his tight pants. Nice pants, Craig. Show off your crack much? Craig grumbled, unsnapping them. He kicked off his sneakers and socks when he got into his room. He took the pants off facing Jeremy. Talking about his beatings was one thing, but showing the bruises was something else. He tossed the pants into the trash can on top of his ripped underwear. Later for them, Craig thought, glad to be rid of them. Hey, Jeremy laughed. I didn't mean for you to throw them away. Craig frowned. They give me wedgies when I ride. I hate wedgies. Not much to your room, huh? Jeremy asked, strategically changing the subject. He thought, oh God, did you just ask for it? It beats the couch, Craig said. I'm a wide open target down there. Craig fished around in his laundry basket for something to wear. He found a pair of black jeans that were only one day dirty. Jeremy suggested he wear shorts instead. Craig said he didn't have any that were clean. Jeremy said it was going to be hot. It'll cool off when the sun goes down, Craig said. He grabbed a fresh pair of briefs and a blue sleeveless shirt out of his dresser. He found a pair of socks in the bottom drawer. He bent way over to get them, his bruises hidden in the attic's shadows, and Jeremy struck. He reached over, grabbed the back of Craig's underwear, and hiked them up, Craig swore, all the way to his shoulders. Craig pushed back and knocked Jeremy off balance. They tumbled onto the bed. Craig landed on top of him. Jeremy's explosion of laughter was immediately followed by a loud ripping sound. Craig gasped as the entire waistband tore off over his head. Jeremy scrambled away, but Craig tackled him. He grabbed Jeremy's underwear and returned the favor. No, no, Jeremy cried. Oh, yes, Craig exclaimed, yanking the underwear up with all of his might. Jeremy laughed. Stop, stop, I give. Craig gave one last good tug before shoving Jeremy onto the floor. He knelt on his bed, his backside facing out the window. He tried very hard to look angry, but he laughed instead. I hate wedgies. Jeremy lay on the floor in a heap. Craig collapsed on the bed. They laughed long and hard. In the distance, mingling with their laughter, they heard the high whine of two state police sirens. Craig's smile slowly faded. He turned and watched them fly past Gibbons' garage, heading toward Misty's cafe. Craig's expression was concerned. They're after my dad, he said. Are you sure? Craig asked, grabbing the socks that fell on the floor. He tossed them to Craig. It could be anybody, you know. Craig shook his head, stripping off the ripped underwear. He tossed them into the trash can, too. He said nothing as he dressed. His underlying fear of his father coming home disappeared. The only time the cops ever go to Misty's is to arrest my dad. Jack wouldn't be around for days now. Craig's uncle and grandmother would leave him in jail. He knew Jeremy was trying to make him feel better by telling him it could be somebody else, but he knew it wasn't. Jack was probably on a short fuse after cutting his foot. Craig wondered what lit that fuse this time. Not much, I'm sure. Craig set it aside. His Uncle Mike knew he was camping tonight. He would see his uncle at work tomorrow. Craig would probably spend the next couple of days with him and Sandra. Jeremy wandered around the attic, picking out his wedgie, while Craig dressed. He thought the attic unremarkable. There weren't a lot of items in here, not like at his house. There were some boxes of storage and an old dressing dummy. They weren't taped up or anything, or in any order like the ones at home. Jeremy's mother considered the storage her domain. Virginia was an organized person. OCD, more like it, Jeremy thought. A box marked, Do Not Touch, drew his attention. He took him to the far side of the room, to the right-hand corner. Jeremy squatted down and peeked inside the flaps. A neatly folded desert camouflage army shirt was on top, with PFC stripes sewn into the collar. Those are my dad's old uniforms from Afghanistan, Craig said, moving behind Jeremy. He rested his forearms on his shoulders. He's got a lot of stuff he brought back from the war. Jeremy nodded. What's that, he asked, 
pointing at a folded pile of tan canvas. There were five wooden poles with it. It was against the seam of the roof behind the boxes. It's a tent, Craig smiled. He almost forgot about it. My dad gave it to me when I was a kid. Really? Jeremy replied. It must be huge. It is, Craig exclaimed. He grabbed hold of a corner of the canvas. It's heavy, too. Give me a hand pulling it out. Jeremy took the corner on the other side. Together, they tugged at the dry canvas. They pulled it free with a groan and extreme effort. The floorboard came up with it as they fell back onto their butts. They looked at the ceiling when they landed. Nails from the shingles were sticking through the roof, looking sharp and threatening. They shivered. The pointed tips were inches from their heads. Jeremy looked at Craig, his eyes wide. We have to be careful. Craig shook his head. We should be glad we didn't get any butt slivers. Jeremy reached beneath him and checked. He sighed with relief when he didn't find any. Dude, he said, kneeling by the canvas. We could fit everybody in this thing. Do you think they would want to? Craig asked. Absolutely, Jeremy exclaimed. He lifted the tent at the fold. Look at it. It's totally cool. I've never even moved it before, Craig remarked, stroking it with his finger. Not since my father had me help him put it over there. I was going to put it under my bed when I moved up here to try and straighten up a bit. He went through the ceiling and told me if I wanted to take it outside, he would help. But if not, to leave it where it was. Would he mind if we took it? Jeremy asked, thinking how nice it would be to stretch out rather than being crowded all night. Craig shrugged. I don't think so. He gave it to me. We'll need some help, though. It's pretty heavy. Brilliant deduction, Sherlock Dugan, Jeremy said. I'll text Chris. We'll need four or five of us all together, Craig remarked. The bag with the pegs and stuff is over there. Craig pointed at a laundry bag that was the same color as the tent. It had U.S. Army stencil on its side. Jeremy nodded. The canvas is too heavy for us, but we could at least get the other stuff downstairs. Jeremy crawled over the canvas, careful not to hit his head on the protruding nails. He grabbed the loose floorboard and was about to put it back when he spotted something. His eyes opened so wide they almost fell out of his head. Oh my God, Jeremy cried, his head snapping back toward Craig. Freaking check this out! Craig crawled over next to him. He looked into the hole in the floor where his friend pointed. His heart began to beat like a trip hammer. Tucked inside, neatly arranged, were an M4A1 carbine assault rifle, eight hand grenades, and a bunch of boxes of ammunition. Craig grabbed the floorboard from Jeremy and quickly replaced it, sweat pouring down his forehead. He turned around and sat, holding his chest and panting. His face was as white as a sheet. What's wrong? Jeremy asked, rubbing his shoulder. Take it easy, Dugan. Craig shook his head. If my dad finds out I know that stuff is up here, he'll kill me. Don't worry about it, Craig, Jeremy said. I won't tell anybody. Can we look at it, though? Craig thought about it. As long as they didn't touch the grenades, it should be okay. If they were leftovers from the war, there was no telling how safe they were. Jeremy agreed to his conditions and removed the floorboard again. The M4 carbine was dusty. Jeremy lifted it out of the hole and suggested they not clean it off. Craig stared at it. Jeremy handed it to him. The weight felt strangely good in his hands as he looked it over. Jeremy took the rifle back, held it up, and aimed it out the window toward the house next door. Craig slapped it down and scowled. Are you nuts? he scolded. Mrs. Turner's practically 90. Are you trying to give her a heart attack? Chill out, Spaz Dugan, Jeremy cried, laughing a little. He held the rifle toward Craig. Do you want to hold it again? Craig shook his head. His stomach was full of butterflies. My dad killed people with that thing. Jeremy stared at it a moment longer. He slipped it back into the hole, careful to make sure he put it in the exact same spot. You better get going, Jeremy said, fishing his iPhone out of his pocket. I'll text Chris now. 
Craig replaced the floorboard and led the way back to the living room. Dad killed people with that thing, his thoughts repeated. The chill he felt went all the way down his spine to his feet.